All right, all right. Welcome back, welcome back. We're at it again. Another Bible study. Another day, another, another Bible study. So, I hope everyone's ready. We're going to take time to let people tune in, jump on, and while we do that, I'll give my regular COVID-19 update, which is, you know, my standard at this point, because that is a major deal going on right now, so we're still... Still under the quarantine here. It is April 8th, 2020. And I'll run through these update numbers while people jump on. Hello, Lisa. So, world cases. Right around 1.5 million. So, you know, that is what it is. Deaths are nearing 88,000. But on a lighter note, the recoveries are 320,000-ish. That's pretty good. So people are living through it. More people are living through it than dying from it, so that's a good sign. Let's see, USA, we got 446,000 and some change on cases and about 14,508 deaths and 22,000 recoveries. But So in the USA, hello, Rebecca. My mom just jumped on, hello. So in the USA, from yesterday to today, we've increased... 1,667 deaths, so not not the most encouraging number there, but at least it's not worse. And so let's see, Tennessee, cases 4,362, deaths 79, the increase from yesterday to today in deaths is 7. So we've got two straight days with, with only 7, so that's pretty good. It's a lot better than what they projected anyway. Let's see, California, 18,000. 401 cases, there's 481 deaths, and they're plus 47 for today. And then let's see, we got, they said Judy said hi, so that's Judy or Eddie, how y'all doing? And then for New York, man, this is, I guess <laughs> New York's crazy, man. They've got 149,000 cases, 6,000 deaths, plus 779 since yesterday. So I think the day before yesterday they had plus 731 or something. And then today, 779. I mean, the U.S. only has 14,500 total, and they've got 6,000 and nearly 300. So, I mean, that's a, that's a lot. It seems like New York's uh, definitely leading the U.S., but that's the way it is sometimes. Hey, Malcolm, you just tuned in. Good to see you, buddy. So that's our standard COVID-19 update. You know, not always the, the best news, but like I said, at least for Tennessee, we're only plus seven, and it was plus seven yesterday, plus seven today. That's that's pretty good. But we're going to continue on our study today of Holy Week. So again, we're all looking forward till Sunday. I, I posted something yesterday, and it was this clip that Ashley showed me of this preacher, man, and he's just talking about Sunday. Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. And, and as you listen to it, man, it, it's it's put in such an awesome way. The way he does it, that it's like it gets you pumped up, man. Sunday's coming, and and it's it just puts some light at the end of the tunnel, no matter what that tunnel looks like. You know, Sunday's coming, and so this study every day we're building, and uh, so we looked at you know Palm Sunday, Jesus coming in on the donkey. Then we looked at Monday where he's in the temple, he's flipping tables, he's just ransacking the place, and then we looked at Tuesday. And Tuesday was just a ton of teaching, man. He's in there teaching. He calls out the Pharisees personally. And so the powder keg is rumbling, man. The fuse has been lit. And they leave out of there. The Pharisees left out of there. Their number one priority was we need to figure out how we're going to get this guy. We're going to have to go by night because the things he's talking about, the things he's doing, the crowds are stirred up. And, and we've got to figure out a way to, to, to stop him. And so they have to, they realize they can't do it in public, man. There's too much of a crowd. It's going to be too much of an uprising. Going to cause all sorts of problems. So that's where they leave, you know. They go off. They're having their little secret meeting, their secret powwow. And their little group is going to prioritize figuring out how to stop Christ and to do it in a, seize him in a, in a manner that, that's not going to cause a riot. And that's what we see later in the week. They come by night. And what we're going to look at today, it's funny because... Matthew and Mark both put Wednesday as the day where Mary anoints Jesus. If you're familiar with scripture, then you know that Mary anoints Jesus and she uses a really expensive jar of perfume to do it. And it's and that's what we're going to look at today. Because again, that's where Matthew and Mark put on Wednesday. And and I was I looked up at Gospel Coalition 
their order of the Holy Week and what scriptures are for each day. And they put it on Wednesday too, but it's funny because with times and just cultural issues and things like that, you can't just be hardcore, this is what happened this day. Because again, there's different times. There's the, the Jewish calendar, the Roman, they had different times of day and stuff. So it can be confusing and people can kind of mess with things and, and bend it to how they want it. But either way, for today, we're going to look at that as the Wednesday teaching. He is going to be at the house of Simon the leper. And so this would have been a guy that he healed. It doesn't tell us that he met Simon somewhere and healed him. But the fact that he's a leper and there's going to be people at his house eating food and hanging out. Well, then you can you can go ahead and bet that he's been healed because lepers aren't exactly ho hosting house parties in the first century. And so so we're going to see that there at Simon the leper's house. What we're going to do is that we're going to read this small portion of scripture in John. And then we're going to read it in Mark because there's different additions i say additions but different details and these details are going to help us understand the complete story a lot of times that's how you got to do with the gospels because you got each one telling it from their perspective you know all inspired by the holy spirit but they'll telling it to a specific audience they're telling it from their perspective so one might have different details that that they've included that another one didn't and and so when we look at this we're going to look at that and we're going to get the complete picture so we'll be looking at john chapter 12 and then we'll be looking at mark chapter 14 and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through each one of those and then we're going to go back and we're going to piece by piece this thing. And we're going to see because basically what he's done here is again, he went in and he kicked the hornet's nest and everything's just stirring up. These Jewish leaders are angry. And so that's what he's caused. Well, now we find him at this house and he's having fellowship. He's relaxing. He's eating dinner. And it, and it kind of, for me, it stood out with that, with the verse where he tells, you know, don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough worries of its own. And, and I think about that, especially with Jesus here, because we don't really know what tomorrow holds. None of us do. We might have some basic plans, but especially now it's real uncertain because right now we're on this quarantine day thing to the 14th. And then, so I've got clients booked for the 15th and that's all under the assumption that I can go back to work the 15th. But the governor might come and say, never mind, we're extending it further. So I can't even really plan on that. I mean, I got it set in place, but it might change. Everything's changing and, and there's really uncertainty. Well, we're talking about Jesus. He literally knows what tomorrow holds. He knows everything at all times. So he's not wondering, you know, oh, I wonder if they're going to come get me at night. I wonder if Jesus is gonna, or if uh, Judas is going to betray me. I wonder if this is going to happen. He already knows. He knows all these things. He knows what's coming. And he's not letting his foreknowledge of, you know, Thursday he's going to be teaching and then he's going to be betrayed. And then Friday he's going to be crucified. He's not letting all of that that we'll see, you know, wear on him in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's not letting that rob him of today. And so even with him knowing what's coming, he's able to relax and have this moment with all these people. He's going to be reclining at this table. He's going to be eating dinner. And so that's that's kind of a takeaway for us is that we would we would cast our cares on him. He knows the future and he's still able to relax in it. And that's the spirit we need to be in that we would acknowledge our circumstance, acknowledge our cares, but don't let it rob us of today's joy. And so that's what we're going to look at him sitting here having this meal with, with a, a really interesting group of people, to be honest with you. So we'll do that. We'll look at that after we, I'm going to read through it and then we'll step back. So starting at John chapter 12, Looking at, we're going to start at verse 2. All right, so they're at Bethany where Lazarus was raised. So that's the, that's where they're at. Lazarus was raised from the dead. In verse 2, it says, They made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief, and as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Therefore Jesus said, Leave her, Let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial, for you always have the poor with you, but you do not, do not always have me. Okay, so that's that reading. Now we're going to flip to Mark chapter 14, and we're going to see how Mark has a different scenario. So we saw in John, he's naming people. He says, Judas says this, there's Mary, there's Martha, there's Lazarus. So he names people in the situation. 
He doesn't name the house they're at. Mark's going to name the house, but then he doesn't name the people. And so we're putting this together. So starting at verse 1 in Mark chapter 14, it says, Now the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him, for they were saying, Not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. All right, verse 3, While he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, and again, this would have been somebody that obviously doesn't have leprosy now. People aren't, aren't going to a leper's house to have dinner. But he's Simon the leper because there's a, he probably always had leprosy up until Jesus came on the scene, healed him, and now this guy who's known as the leper isn't a leper anymore. So he's having this little house gathering, and it says, And reclining at the table there came a woman with an alabaster vial. Now we know from John that was Mary. And a very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. So one thing, in John it said poured it over his feet. So what we see here is first she pours it either on his feet or on his head, but she does both, okay? And it says, But some were indignantly remarking to one another, Why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. So, so again, it says they in this text, and the other one, it put it on Judas. And so what we can gather in putting that together, we know Mark's, or we know John's true in saying it was Judas that said it. But what we can see here in Mark is, you know, it's a very, it's a very logical reasoning kind of statement. Because, in fact, they could have sold it and, and given it to the poor. And so you would think that this sentiment was not just Judas. Now, we know the motive of Judas was wrong because where we just read in John. So we don't know that the motives of the other disciples was that. I mean, clearly Judas was doing it out of greed because he wanted to steal from, from the money box because he was the treasurer. But the others, it says they joined in on this, but their motives aren't wrong. They're just thinking, yeah, that's a, that's a really good idea. We could have given that to the poor. We could have helped some people with it. And so that's where it says... Why have they wasted this? For the perf perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor, and they were scolding her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will always be spoken of in memory of her. And so she's done a great thing. And Jesus stands up for her and telling these guys, you don't even know what you're talking about here. You're missing the perspective because there's a perspective here. There's the earthly perspective and then there's the heavenly perspective. And so Mary's got it. Mary has been on from the time we see her mentioned in scripture. Let's take a look at, um, before we go any further, let's set the table here, okay? So we know it's the house of Simon the leper, okay? Because this, this is a house party they're having dinner. We got Simon the leper there, which would have been the healed leper. That's an amazing thing. You got a guy sitting here who literally has been healed of leprosy. He's, a, he's sitting there as a miracle of healing right at the table, okay? Then next, you got Lazarus sitting there. This guy was dead for four days in a tomb. There was a big ordeal. Christ came, raised him from the dead. You got this guy sitting there at this table, just just a, a living, breathing, eating, talking, walking evidence of the power of God. So much so that, let me read verse 12, let me see, John 12, verse 10. It says, But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Everybody knew he was dead for so long. This dude is just a walking testimony of the power of God and the evidence of Christ being the Son of God. And so that dude's sitting at the table. So you got Simon the healed leper, you got Lazarus raised from the dead, and then you got the 12 disciples, you know, one of which is Judas here, as we see pointed out, but everybody else would have been there too. So they're all hanging out. But then you've got Martha. It tells us Martha was serving, okay? And this is interesting because Mary and Martha, we're, we're going to jump to them. We'll look at... Um, Luke chapter 10, because we're going to look at Martha, because it's, it's a very small statement here about Martha, but it says a whole lot. So let me flip to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, I'm going to read you a short little piece here about Mary and Martha, okay? So this is when they pop up on the scene. It's Luke chap chapter 10, starting at verse 38. It says, Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village, which is Bethany, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. 
But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So what happened originally is Martha was bitter in this moment because she's doing all the work. Mary's at the feet of Jesus just listening. I mean, Mary's just sitting there soaking it in. And Jesus points out to her, you're focused on things that are unimportant in comparison. You know, you've got Jesus in your house teaching you. That's number one priority. And so this, he's, he, he tells her the same thing I looked at, I guess it was yesterday when Peter's asking about John, you know, what's going to happen to John? And Jesus said, worry about yourself, follow me. Focus on me individually. Don't be in everybody else's business. And that's a very biblical teaching. I'm going to flip to a couple of texts here. Let me look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'll read you a quick text here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 11 and 12 says this. And this is a timeless lesson, guys. So let's listen closely. It says, For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. No such persons we command or and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. So again, he's telling, don't be a busybody. Eat your own bread. Don't be in everybody else's business. Hi, Eddie. Hi, Kim. Everybody that waved on there. Daryl. And so that's a lesson that is timeless. Don't be a busybody in everybody's business. What we saw there, we just looked at originally when Martha was serving, she was that. She was concerned, well, hey, I'm serving and this person's not. And Jesus says, you're serving, keep serving. Don't worry about what this person's doing. And so don't be a busybody. Then let me see 1 Timothy 5.13. Let me read this one. 1 Timothy 5.13. It says, at the same time, they also learn to be idle as they go around from house to house and not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies talking about things not proper to mention. And this talks about the idle hands. You know, you're not keeping yourself busy doing your own stuff. And now you find yourself in everybody else's business and it turns into gossip and it turns into meddling and, it talk, and, and all those sorts of things. First Peter 4.15. 1 Peter 4.15. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, a thief, or evildoer, and listen to this one, or a troublesome meddler, okay? It's in the list with murderers, thieves, evildoers, troublesome meddler. Don't meddle in other people's stuff. You know, everybody's got their thing going. Stay focused on yours, and then from there we branch out. But it's that number one, your relationship with Jesus. And so all that to say, when we come back here, it makes this statement about Martha. Martha was serving. Martha's not concerned with what Mary's doing, with what Lazarus is doing. This has been a transformation. Originally, that was something that, that bothered her. Well, now we see in, the, in the, the chapter before at the tomb, she professes this, uh, this knowledge of the Lord. In chapter, chapter 11, verse 21, Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. She's got that confidence. There's been a transformation. She's no longer worried about where Mary's sitting or where Mary's working or not working. She knows I am a servant of the Lord. I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to do my serving. Or whether other people serve or not, I'm serving. And so that's a big statement there. It says Martha was serving. It's simple, but it's big. And that's where that's where we need to be. You know, if God calls you to serve, go serve. And you say, well, this guy's not doing as much as me. Whatever, man. It doesn't matter. You need to focus on you. God wants you to serve. You go serve. If God doesn't put that on your heart, put something different. Whatever he puts on your heart, go do that. And don't worry about other people. Worry about yourself. And that's where we find Martha here. She's worried about serving, and that's it. It doesn't matter if anybody helps or not. And so instead of her complaining to Jesus that, hey, you know, Mary is not helping. She's anointing you. You know, it's not even a concern anymore. And let's see. We're going we're gonna to proceed on here. Let's look at these verses again. Let's go to... It says, but Lazarus, let's go to verse three. So let's look at Mary anointing the feet of Jesus. And it says she washed it with her hair. She is basically giving this extravagant display of worship with the best thing she has to offer. It's, it's, it's really, it's what God deserves. She knows the worth of Jesus. 
Whether anybody in that room knows it or not, she knows the worth of Christ and she's going to give him the best she has. So this perfume, I mean, if she would have had 10 bottles of this stuff, she would have given, she would have done this with all 10. You know, this is what she had. This is what she gives him. He deserves the best. I'm going to give it to him. And that's her heart. And that's where she's at right here. She's humble and she's at the feet of Christ and she's anointing him. And in that, that's the lesson. The lesson is that Christ is worth it. When we look at this, we need to have the proper perspective, and that is to see that we have a lady who is worshiping the Savior. That's a beautiful thing. Now, what you'll see also is where we get Judas. You know, out of his greed, he's looking at it from a whole different perspective, and he's trying to pick it apart and find these problems. Well, you know, we could have done this better. Well, you could have done this instead. Well, it's for the Lord, so nothing for the Lord is wasted. And so when they say this is wasted, that's a, that's, a, that's a big allegation there because what, what one sees as worship, another sees as waste. And so we see Mary sees it as worship, Christ sees it as worship, but Judas sees it, sees it as waste. And then he ends up kind of influencing the other guys where they consider that thought too. And so Jesus corrects it, but let's look at what it says back here in verse chapter four, Mark 14, verse 4. Mark, Mark 14, verse 4. It says, and again, it puts the they on it. It puts the group. But it says, why has this perfume been wasted? Wasted, guys. Now imagine Christ in your house. And then you go do this. You go pull out something great. You give it to Christ. It, you pour it out before him. And then somebody thinks, hey, man, you wasted that. That's, that's insane. It's insane. And it's, it's, it's really the motive of someone who doesn't understand. And it reminds me of where we saw where the Sadducees were trying to catch Jesus. And he says, you lacked understanding of the scriptures and knowledge of the power of God. And that's where Judas is. He lacks complete understanding of the situation. And because of that, it's all from the wrong perspective. And he only sees the problem in it. He doesn't even see the worship. He doesn't see the fact that Christ deserves it. And then there's the statement in here that she's preparing his body for this burial, that this anointing is in preparation for what's to come. These guys all collectively don't understand that he's about to be put to death, that he's about to suffer on the cross. He's told them, but they don't get it. But we see Mary here and her simplicity of sitting and listening to him and just being obedient in herself. She understands that she's anointing him, not just as king here, but also for the coming burial. So she's got more of an understanding of this situation than even the disciples who've been following him around for three years. And it's just, it's one of those things. We think of the heroes of the faith and we think of, uh, you know, the apostles and, and, and they're all wonderful, but let's not lose focus here of somebody that's only mentioned a few times in scripture. And she is a, a great example of faith in action, of just pure obedience, pure obedient worship of just Christ is worth it. If for nothing else, you pour it out because he's worth it. And, and she does, she just, it, it's like you can't control it. You know, she's compelled to do this. She, she comes in and she does it and she's compelled. And it reminds me also of, of Paul when he says, you know, far be it for me to not preach the gospel because I feel compelled to do it. How could I not preach the gospel? I feel compelled to do it. The Holy Spirit compels me. And that's her. She's not thinking about, oh, this is going to cost a bunch. Oh, this, this is going to be a waste of this or a waste of that. All she's thinking of is my Savior deserves it and I'm going to do it for him. And then let's look at, uh, let's look at this uh, next portion of this. Because there's a part of this this whole section that can be just skewed and be taken right out of context and be, be, be put into a questionable situation. And that's where he says, you will always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. And so he's not disregarding the fact that there are poor people that could have benefited from this perfume. What he's trying to point out here is this is a unique situation. She's not going to be one of the ladies at the tomb later. She knows, man, this is it. This is my chance. I've got the Savior here. This is the final week. It's coming. I've got this jar. What better time to use it than now? This is a unique opportunity. And so are there going to be the poor, poor around all the time? Absolutely. We live in a fallen world with fallen men and, and, and hearts that operate in greed and, and, and just... We see it all the time as greed and corruption. You know, there might be a politician up there that, that will the, present this picture of a utopia as if we could all just be successful together and everything's going to be great. There'll be no poor. We can get rid of the classes and stuff like that. But men in power are corrupt. It's just, it's been like that since, since the fall. And so that's why Christ says you're always going to have the poor with you. So if there's a politician up there that says something to the effect of we can eliminate the, the, 
poverty levels. Well, guess what? According to Christ, you're not going to, and it's because men are corrupt, men are evil. We might move in that direction, but all in all, it's going to be abused, and it's never going to happen. And that's the thing. The, the utopia is not going to be achieved by governments, by earthly governments, by earthly men. It's only going to be when the final, when the new Jerusalem comes down and God wipes every tear away and removes all pain, then we'll get to where, you know, nobody's poor, nobody's rich. We're all in the same boat. But he says it here to point that out, that you're trying to, to use this earthly argument to devalue this situation and to make her feel like she made a mistake. She didn't make a mistake by pouring her her expensive uh, perfume on the Lord, the Lord who who is going to die for her later this week and to die for all of us. She didn't make a mistake in that. And so Judas, again, the argument is a standard human argument and it has some validity to it, but his motive is exposed to us because the, the Lord knows his motive. And so that's why it says he didn't ask because he was concerned about the poor back here in John 12, verse 16, but he asked because he was a thief. And he used to steal money. And if they can add these 300 denarii to this box, well, then he can take, you know, 100 or 50 or whatever, and they're not going to notice because he's the one in control of it. And so that's his motive in this. But look, it says um, in verse 7, back in Mark 14, there's again, there's, there's added little sentences here, and they make a big difference. And it says in verse 8, it says, She has done what she could. And that's a, that's a very powerful statement. Like I said, if she would have had 10 bottles, she would have done it because he's worth it. There's nothing we're going to offer God that's ever going to be enough. So if you offer him the best you have, he still deserves more. She offered the best she had. She has done what she could is what Christ says here. And still, she probably knows this isn't enough. I wish I had more. And the heart that has been, that had been turned towards the Lord, that's, that's how we think. I wish I could give you more, Lord. Now, this other heart's going to say, well, I wish we could have sold it. I could have gave you less. We could have done this. We could have done No, I wish I could give you more. I wish I could give you more time. I wish I could give you more obedience. I wish I could just do more. And so that's her, her thing. She did all that she could. She anointed my body beforehand for the burial. So he points that out again. But look at verse 9. This is, it's not in, in John chapter 12, but in verse 9, it says, Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. It doesn't say all these other guys sitting at this table. He doesn't look, I already went through the miraculous people at this table as far as a healed leper, someone raised from the dead. The disciples have been following. He singles out the one who in their simplicity has just exercised an extravagant worship scene. And he says, this one, whenever you speak the gospel, this one is going to be the one that's remembered. And so that's a, that's a powerful statement. And what I, what I want to look at in particular is, let me look at three instances, okay? These are three instances that we see Mary. And look, I'm going to, there's a common thread to all of them. And so let me see here. Luke 10, 39. I'll read this to you. Luke 10, 39. It says, she had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. All right. I mean, how simple does it get? The Lord's there. She's seated at his feet listening to his word. It's, it's just such a simple, you know, come as little children kind of deal. We overcomplicate this stuff so much. Every time I study any of this, there's so many big words because so many smart people are, are so good at things. And it's a wonderful thing that they can break stuff down. But it's, it's so simple that even a child can understand. Sit at the feet of Jesus and listen. That's, that's it. That's what she did. And look, we find her now in a position where she's going to be remembered forever. We're reading about her today. 2,000 years later, we're reading about Mary who broke this perfume bottle over the Savior. All because right here it started with something as simple as sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. I mean, that's where it starts. It's as simple as that. Let's look at uh, John eleven thirty two. So this is going to be, this is again, when Christ came and he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus is in the tomb. Her brother's in the tomb. And let me read this to you. So that's going to be verse 32. It says, Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then it mentions Jesus, therefore, saw her weeping. And the Jews came, the Jews who came with her weeping also. And he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. 
But my point is, she now we see her, she fell at the feet of Jesus. Again, she was at the feet of Jesus listening. Now she's at the feet of Jesus sobbing, okay? Either way, she's at the feet of Jesus again. She knows where to go. My brother's dead. Life is hitting me with some hard stuff. I'm going to the feet of Jesus. And it's so simple. She learned it a long time ago. And then we come here in verse 3 of chapter 12. It says, Mary took the pound of costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. So we see her again, this time at the feet of Jesus again. She's anointed his feet. She's taken her hair down, which in, in the, the Jewish world for a woman to take her hair down was a was um, promiscuous, you would say. It, it was an insult. It was, it was not something that a classy lady would do. She's done this, and she's wiping his feet. And so she enters into this humility in this situation. She doesn't care what, what Simon the leper thinks. She doesn't care what Lazarus thinks. She doesn't care what the 12 disciples thinks. Other people's opinions haven't even crossed her mind. What are they going to say about this? Are they going to say, I shouldn't have done that and I should have gave it to the poor? No, I don't care what they're going to say. I'm going in here to worship my Savior, the one who I sat at his feet and listened, the one I fell to his feet and he raised my brother from the dead, the one who I know his worth, I know his value, I know what's coming, and I understand that he deserves this and he's worth it and I'm going to do it. And that's where you see her. She doesn't care about other people's opinion. That's really what we need to learn is that, you know, if you want to worship the Lord and be overzealous about it and you want to be bold about it don't worry about being ridiculed by men don't worry about being being looked down upon by others or being judged because again she faces it says they scolded her for doing this it says literally they they scolded her so judas points out that this could have been done a different way and then the group scold her because they're in agreement with yeah it could have been done a different way because again it's a valid argument and Jesus says, leave her alone. She's done a good deed to me. You're always going to have the poor. I'm not always going to be here. And so you need to go ahead and understand she took advantage of a unique position. And because of that, she's going to be remembered forever. She's gonna, Every time they hear that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised on the third day, and ascended into heaven, she is going to be part of that memory. And and that's a big deal. But it's, it's, it's kind of alluded to also in Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, when these Pharisees come to him, and it says, And they said to him, I'll read this, The disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, You cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the days will come, and when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. So it's again, it's understanding the situation. Jesus is in their house. It's the final week. It's not that she, you know, disregarded the poor because she could have sold this and been and helped them. It was the fact that she understood the value of the moment. You got to take advantage of this moment, man. Christ is here and he's not always going to be here. So when it's, they were saying what we just read, why don't your guys fast? Man, they'll fast after. Right now we're doing some things. We're taking care of business. Christ is here. They can fast when he's gone. She can help the poor when he's gone. That's what he says. The poor are always going to be there. You can always do this. She's not disregarding the poor forever. She's just seeing the value of Christ in this moment. He deserves it. And, and that's where we, where we get out of that situation is that, you know, that she's a, a heck of an example of just obedient faith and knowing the value of the Lord. And I say that because when we look at the faith chapter, we look at Hebrews chapter 11, it runs through a list of Old Testament saints. You know, and each one's faithful, obedient, obedient. And it's great, and it's awesome, and they're doing great things. If they were to, if there would have been another chapter of just New Testament saints, you better believe Mary's going to be in there. And she's going to be just a model of obedience, a model of simplicity, of just falling at the feet of Jesus every chance you get. That's what she did. And here we get her being lifted up, man. You're going to, whenever the gospel's spoken, people are going to know about this lady because she did it right. And so we see her as a prime example of how we should be. And the simplicity of how we should be. But let's continue on here. We're going to look at... Mark chapter 14. And we'll look at verse 10. Because again, we just looked at this situation. And we, and we, we know that Judas, man, his, his heart is evil. It's just, he was looking at it as a way of, I could steal some more stuff. That's his motive. And we're going to see him on verse 10. Look at verse 10. 
we're going to go to a different portion in a minute, but look at verse 10. It says, Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. They were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money, and he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. Now, that's where, G where Judas leaves this. So this was like the, the final straw for him. For whatever his motive was, whether he just you know gave up on Jesus as the Messiah, whether he never believed Jesus was going to be the guy all along, we know from the beginning he's labeled a devil. You know, it says that when Jesus picked the 12, I had it written down somewhere, when Jesus picked the 12, he said, I picked you 12, and behold, one of you is a devil. He knew from the beginning, one of you guys is going to betray me. Again, we're talking about the Son of God here. We're talking about God in the flesh. Knew it all, knows it all, that's where he's at. And so he knew the heart of Judas when he made this comment. The other guys didn't. That's why the other guys were like, yeah, that's not. That's a good point. It's, it's, it's when um, Christ even says, there's one of you that's going to betray me, and it shows all the other disciples looking around, well, who's it going to be? They don't know the heart of Judas. As far as they're concerned, he's a good guy just like they are. Everybody's in the same boat. We're all following Jesus. And, but he's not hiding it from the Lord. The Lord knows it. And so he leaves this, and he goes to these chief priests, and he says, I'll betray him. They offer him 30 pieces of silver. And he'll betray him. And and the thing is, it's a real low offer. So it's 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 insane that that he would devalue Christ. Where you got one that just put this elaborate price on on the savior. She dumped it out, she poured it out. This was a year's salary for the average person back then and she dumps it out. And then you get Judas that comes back and for so little just portrays the savior. I mean, and it's just that's your spectrum, that's your perspectives. And as, again, we're one saw worship, one saw waste. And it's just, it's crazy. But you you, you got to understand the value of the Lord. She understood the value of the Lord and Judas didn't. And it plays out in scripture. And so this is at the end of this day, Judas goes, he's going to make his deal. But let's look at this. Let's look at this. Luke 22. This is one of the key verses here because this sets up everything. And what I mean is our understanding of the next few days have to be have to be complete because you got to understand it's all God's plan God's God's plan from the beginning of time he knew this was coming and he knew this was the way it's going to happen and there's going to be godless men that carry it out there's going to be godless men that carry it out and there's Satan's going to be playing a part in it but it's still God's plan so don't get that mistaken but you got to understand Satan and his demons and his enemies, they don't know the plan. They're just doing what their selfish desires are saying to do. And so let's look here. Luke 22 at verse 3. And this is the only part of this day that we see in Luke is these 3 through 6. Okay, so a little portion here. And it says, And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money, so he confronted or he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray, to betray him to them apart from the crowd. So what I want to point out here is we saw that Judas was operating with a greedy heart. His motives are wrong, man. He's not he's only he's been stealing from them the whole time. So for years now, you know, he's following, he's hearing these teachers, he's not taking a man. He's over here operating, doing what he wants, and again, Christ knew it. He called him a devil. It says the, that Satan entered into him. You know, he, he is operating in a manner that Satan can enter right in. He's not operating alongside God or with the Holy Spirit. And so that's why it says Satan entered into him. And what I mean to do that, to, to point that out, we'll see Satan enters into him again. But to make this engagement with these chief priests and to, to kind of set up this contract for X amount of dollars, I will betray him. This is an act of Satan in his life. Satan is moving this and motivating this in a person that can be used in that way. And then we'll see, let me see here. I want to say, it's at the Last Supper. Again, I had that written down too. But it says Satan entered into him and he went to betray Jesus. And, I don't know, maybe it's in Matthew. Either way, Again, we see that Satan's moving Judas in these options. And what I mean to say is you got to understand that 
I've, I've, I've talked to somebody before that they thought, well, Satan didn't want Jesus to go to the cross because, you know, Satan knew the plan and that was the plan of salvation. Well, you know, Satan doesn't know that part of the plan. If we look at 1 Peter, let me, let me flip to this. We're going to read a couple scriptures. We're going to set this up. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 10. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So again, right there, as to this salvation, the sufferings of Christ, the glories to follow, it says in verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. Angels, they, they didn't understand this either. They were messengers, so they weren't bringing this. They were doing the best, bringing the message that was given to them by God. Satan, a fallen angel, is not all-knowing, okay? He didn't know all this. It says it right here. Ephesians 3, 8 and 10. Read this real quick. Ephesians 3, 8 through 10. It says, To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what was what is the administration of the mystery for a which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Again, now it can be made known after the fact. But you see, Satan again, he's working through Judas to betray Christ, and then he's going to work through Judas to bring about his betrayal in the garden and his arrest and getting him sent to the cross and working through godless men and putting all their selfish hearts into effect and move all these pieces into place because he thinks he can win. He's deluded. Satan literally thinks he can win. It shows it in, in when he goes before the Lord in Job. He's, he's challenging him there. He really, he really thinks that he can win in this situation. And then if you look at Isaiah 14, when he says, you know, I will ascend to the highest heavens. You see, we see the heart of, of Satan himself saying these I will statements. He really thought, hey, I will do this. Like as if he can, he can conquer the Lord. And it's, it's just, it's insanity, but that's the delusion of pride and arrogance, the pride of Satan. We know that uh, in Revelation chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20, this is after a whole bunch of stuff has happened. It says, look at verse 7. Revelation 20, verse 7. It says, When the thousand years are complete, completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. That's Gog and Magog to gather them together for the war. The numbers of them is like the sand of the seashore. He literally still rallies as if he can win. And we're talking, this is at, at, at the very end of times. And it says, and they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Again, Satan is so deluded into thinking that he is going to defeat the Lord. The Lord, he, when he went to the cross, Satan's thinking, oh yeah, now we got him. And then he's, he's really just... It's, it's, it's hard to even explain the delusion, but you see it in, in the average person in the world too as they mock and they ridicule and they blaspheme. And if you know the Lord and you know the power of the Holy Spirit, then it's mind-boggling when you see it, but you got to understand, man, they're, they're, they're operating under a different mind. And that's where Judas was. He was operating under a different mind. But again, before we were enlightened, we were too. Let me read you Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 3, it says, And you were dead in your, trespass, in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of obedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And so, as we look on that, we know that's the default setting. When we come into the world, we're, we're in sin and we need to turn to the Lord. So it's, it's just, it's the setting of the, of the one that's unenlightened, the one that the Lord has not born again. And so it is mind boggling because we have the mind of Christ and it's a whole different understanding. It's a whole different spiritual perspective. And, and I say that just to, to illustrate that comparison in that moment, in the study we just looked at, you know, Mary had that eternal perspective. 
She had that what we would call the mind of Christ. She knew his worth, and she knew the obedience and the worship and the simplicity of falling at the feet of Jesus. And then you got Judas, who didn't have that. He was still operating in this default mind, this mind of I'm going to do selfish gain. If, I could, if she would have sold that, I could have stole from it. And, and there's a lot of people like that, man. I mean, that you got to think, it's, the, the scriptures talk of a remnant and not a majority. So we're not looking out in the world and thinking, man, and everybody here is probably mostly saved. That's not what scripture says. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And there's times of trial and tribulation, and it's going to shrink and shrink and shrink. And God's going to draw out his remnant. And so we need to, to, to just be falling at the feet of Jesus, as Mary did. She's a great example in the lesson we just looked at. Fall at the feet of Jesus. It don't matter if you're just coming to him today or if you've known him for a long time, if your brother just died, as we saw when she fell that time, or if you're just, hey, man, today's a good day and he's worthy of my worship. You know, it's just one of those things. Fall at the feet of Jesus. Let's see here. All right, I went on that little tangent because, again, we're going to continue on in the next couple days. We're going to look at Thursday which is going to be that upper room discourse. It's going to be where he, he institutes the Lord's Supper. And then he's going to give them some powerful teachings. Now, for the sake of time, I'll be skimming through and hitting some, some key points throughout that because, honestly, it deserves so much more than I'll be able to give it in an hour. I mean, it deserves a long bit of time to be able to get a bunch of the nourishment that's in that scripture. I mean, it, it is it is a heavy portion of scripture, that upper room discourse, and it's an, it's an amazing piece of text, too. So we'll be looking at that, and that's going to be in John. And so we'll look at that tomorrow. And then Friday, that's Christ going to the cross. Okay? That's going to be some good scripture to look at and it's going to be a time of reflection and it's just it's heavy it's heavy it's heavy we're going to look at the suffering servant we're going to look at being forsaken of god all as just part of that friday man it's a big friday the full wrath of god is just it's an it's unfathomable just like that we see the unfathomable riches of christ and what i just read well there's the unfathomable wrath of god and so we're going to look at that on Friday. Then we'll look at Saturday. We'll look at that day in between. And that's the day where you would have had that uncertainty. You would have had the disciples sitting back thinking, man, did we have it wrong? He just died on a cross. It, 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 and then you, they're sitting in that, in that kind of that limbo of, you know, what's right? What's wrong? Do I run? Do I stay? And, and they're just, it would have been a time of panic and uncertainty. And then we'll look at the glorious Sunday, the resurrection, you know, when he comes back. I mean, he conquers death and he proves it. And so there's a, a lot to look at, but that's why I went on that tangent about saying, you know, Satan moving these parts, Satan's moving Jesus or moving Judas to make these moves because that is the plan of evil, not knowing that their evil moves are actually fulfilling the Lord's plan. And I think it's Acts chapter two. I think Peter says this and he puts it into good words because, hey, man, you can't beat scripture. So I might sit here and talk, but scripture going to say a lot better than I do. So look, Acts chapter two. Verse 22, and this is Peter. He says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predestined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. So again, the plan was predetermined. It is by, and it says, and by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Anything we're talking about that's predetermined or predestined is always going to be mentioning foreknowledge alongside it. God knows everything, and he's not looking forward in time to figure it out. He operates in total knowledge at all times. If, if, if we would have to look back, what did I do yesterday? Let me think about it. What am I going to do tomorrow? Let me think about it. God's never in the let me think about it zone. And so he knows everything at all times. That makes everything predestined. That doesn't eliminate our choices in a matter, but it's just the fact that he knows that godless men are going to operate in pride and they're going to operate in arrogance. He knows that Satan, out of his own selfishness, is going to start to move and he'll move Judas. And God uses his own, these godless men, he uses them in his plan to carry out his will. And that's what we see in the world today. A lot of times we look at bad things and we think, oh man, is God causing this bad thing? Or is God using this bad thing? Those are very, very, very different things here. And so 
Is God using it? Absolutely. Is God causing it? Only if it's a direct judgment. You know, there's a lot of free radicals out there. We are subject to a fallen world. We're subject to death and decay. We're subject to consequence from bad decision. But it doesn't mean that God caused us to make the bad decision. So a lot of stuff to marry there as far as his will and then our ability to operate freely in his will. And he says that there. But let me see here. So you nail to a cross by the hands of godless men, but it's by the predetermined plan, the foreknowledge of God. And I'll read Ephesians chapter 1 real quick. Like Ephesians chapter 1 says this. It says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And what I mean to say is, before the foundation of the world, this plan was in action. Again, God knows everything at all times. Before God said, let there be light, before he made the move on creation, before he did any of that, this plan was already known. He knew Adam was going to sin. He knew that there was nothing that Adam would be able to do to make up for it and that he would have to create the way of salvation and that Christ would have to come suffer. All of this stuff was, was foreknown. It was already foreknown. Therefore, when he said, let there be light, when he let, move that ball rolling, it was already an act of mercy that he didn't just give up on us and say, we're not doing that. But the fact is, within the Trinity, he already knew, man, we're going to display our love on some people that are messing up. And guess what? There's a perfect will amongst the Trinity. There would have been no, no uh, wrestling for, well, I don't want to do that. You think Christ was in the Trinity saying, no, I'd rather not. And God said, yeah, yeah, you will. And so there's none of that. There's a perfect harmony. So just as the Father's wrath has to be um, satisfied, so his wrath has to be satisfied. Well, it doesn't mean that he forced Jesus against his will to go in there and satisfy it. The fact is, Christ went not as a victim, but as a volunteer. He went sacrificially, and he didn't go as somebody that's going to just be a victimized. He went in there to conquer. And that's what we got to understand here. All of this predetermined. We'll see godless men having an influence. You'll see Pontius Pilate. You'll see uh, Ananias or Ananias and Caiaphas, the high priest. You'll see corruption. You'll see all these evil moves. But what you got to understand is God's ordained it to take place because he's going to use it for his purpose. And so he lets these men make these moves all according to his will and his perfect plan. So that's a glorious thing. And, and I'll say from the, from the video I watched yesterday, you know, Sunday's coming. So no matter what it looks like in these next few days as we study these, Sunday is coming. When we see him go to the cross and you're like, man, how heartbreaking, Sunday's coming. That's not the end of the story. Because if Christ dies on the cross and he don't re he's not resurrected on Sunday, then guess what? He goes down in history as just another person who claimed to be the Messiah. But the fact is, he is raised on Sunday, and that's the game changer. That's All those miracles he did before are now confirmed even further because of what happens on Sunday. So Sunday's coming, and it's an amazing deal. He conquers death. He conquers Satan. And the thing is, there was never any doubt in the mind of Christ. There's never any doubt. And that's where we're at. We have the mind of Christ. There's not any doubt. We don't operate in doubt. And we need to be at the feet of Jesus just as Mary was. So that fills us up for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll continue tomorrow. We'll look at Thursday. We'll look at that upper room. We're going to see the power of the Lord and we're going to see his clear message on the Holy Spirit coming in and the Holy Spirit's role as the paraclete, as, the, as, our, uh, as Christ goes, the Spirit comes, lives in each of us. So we're not limited by proximity. We're going we're gonna to look at that. And so thanks, Malcolm, Rebecca, Terry. Y'all have a good night. Everybody, Nietzsche, I see you there. So look, I'll be back on tomorrow. We will look, Eddie, Judy, thank you. We will look at the events of Thursday. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to get powerful. It's going to get powerful. The stuff on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I mean, up till now, it's been great. Don't get me wrong. But it's building and building. Like I said, it's a powder keg. The fuse has been lit. We saw Jesus relaxing today. He's going to be teaching tomorrow. And then tomorrow night, we'll look at that betrayal. And it's, man, it's going to set off a series of events that have just changed the course of history. It has changed the way we date the world. I mean, the fact that we're looking at the calendar the way we look at it is because of what we're going to look at for the rest of this week. And so it's going to be awesome to go over it. And just reading it's enough, but then discussing it, man, it's, 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 going, to be, it's going to be an amazing thing. So everybody stay well. Take your vitamins. Eat your vegetables. You know, Let, let's put our best effort into combating a potential virus if you get it. But either way, stay prayed up. 
read up. I hope to see everybody here tomorrow. Lord willing, we'll be on tomorrow, 7 o'clock, looking at Thursday of Holy Week. I think it's called Mon Monday Thursday. So, thanks again.